Welcome, Base Church. We're really excited to bring this resource to you. Trust you're going to enjoy it. Morning, folks. Great to be with you again this morning. Uh, welcome to today's service. I'm going to just, uh, let's just go into the notices uh, before we go into some of the other things that we want to discuss with you this morning. It's a wonderful day this morning, uh, and even better in the knowledge that we are uh, actually meeting at the church for the first time in uh, a long time. So we're very excited about that. But at the same time, we're excited that we can still uh, be part of what uh, you guys are doing as you're unable to uh, be part of what we're doing um, uh, in the physical at the base church because you might be in an address, an address group or might not be feeling well. So, so we we are praying for you. Uh, we will be praying for you on Sunday as well. And uh, I just want to encourage you at this time to to stay connected uh, with your virtual group if you're a, a, a person that needs to still be in a virtual group. And if you're in the base at home groups, please continue to meet, meet in the physical, keep connected with another one another and build relationship. Uh, what we have seen in the very uh, quick run up to trying to get the service going on Sunday is that the service team leaders and the, um, the guys that have led their groups that have stayed connected uh, we're finding that the people are, are, are plugged in and ready to go. Where we've neglected the, the, um, our groups in terms of our leadership of them and in a, in a situation where um, uh, the, the service team leaders haven't kept connected, we're finding they are struggling to, to get connected with guys. So I just want to encourage you if, you, if you are a leader and you're leading a group, a virtual group or a base at home group, Please uh, try and stay connected with your team. It's so important. Your your the people that relate to you are really motivated by the fact that you stay in touch with them. So remember that this morning. Let's go into the notices. Welcome, Base Church. We're excited for you to join us. Here are a couple of notices for you before we hand over to our team for this morning's message. Great. So a couple more notices that we want to keep separate was just encourage you to continue to give with your tithes and offerings. Really important in terms of running the church and obviously the things that we still want to do. Um, the one that we want to cover right now is the, the food packs that we'd like to do. We're still making calls for some donations for that, uh, some free will offerings. Just remember to either put it in an envelope that's, that's, uh, that, that, um, that's headed, uh, hampers or food packs and likewise with your with your if you're making deposits just with a reference uh food packs or or hampers so that we know where to allocate the, those funds the other one that we want to remind you of is the uh chimani money outreach at the moment it's for 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 men and women so don't feel that you it's only for men exclusively uh i think there's about 50 percent of the people have shown interest haven't quite signed up. We will have a budget for you, which will be circulated quite soon. Uh, but please, we're still looking for a couple of, a few more guys or women to go up there. Um, and that's on the 17th. If you'd like more information or or to discuss it a bit more with anyone, please contact Paul Mitchell. Um, he's just heading up the coordination uh, for the team for that. Uh, we're going to be painting a school uh, and maybe doing some electrical installation up in uh, Chimani Mani at a school up there. So please remember that. And um, that's it for the notices this week. But again, just a reminder to the base at home groups, they are still meeting both our virtual and our physical um, at home groups. If you're in a place where you can't come to church, but you can meet in your base at home uh, group, please do that. And please stay in contact with one another. So we're really, really excited this morning to bring you um, some uh, another word in our MythBuster series. The the series this uh, this or well, the extension on the series this morning is biblical prosperity, and that's going to be shared with um, by by Andre. So um, we're really looking forward to that. Um, it, it gives us a very clear idea. 
um, that prosperity is not only uh, financial prosperity. There's so much more to that. And Andre is going to be sharing a bit um, on that with us this morning. Um, I just want to bring your attention to, if you haven't uh, registered or wondering how the registration works for being part of the Sunday service, um, we, we've got a link which we've circulated on the platforms where you open that link. It takes you to a Google page where you're asked how many adults and how many children be, will be attending and you'll press submit and that will, that will register you for the service. So if you haven't registered and you'd like to register, please do. Um, and if you're wanting to register for, for next week, just remember to go to that link. It's also on our web page uh, if you can't find it on any of the platforms. And you can do the registration online through our web page. So, uh, Andre, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you this morning. In our current series, Mythbusters, we've been covering the foundations of faith. Last week, Talent spoke about generosity. Today, I want to speak about a closely related and often misunderstood topic, biblical prosperity. The subject is a minefield of bad teaching, and in the process of finding truth, we may explode some cherished beliefs. So I'd like to begin with an appeal. If you disagree with me on these issues, please search the scriptures. Do not select isolated scriptures out of context that support a particular viewpoint. Look at the whole topic. This is a vast subject, and I doubt I'll be able to do it adequate justice in the time that we have, but I want to address three of the most common myths about biblical prosperity. These myths involve misunderstandings of God's sovereignty and God's providence, and they can be summarized in the statements, prosperity means I'll be financially wealthy, or financial wealth is proof of God's approval and financial lack is evidence of his disapproval. And thirdly, Prosperity means that I'm shielded from all difficulties and challenges in life. Jesus taught frequently about money, especially the use and misuse of money. And many letters of the New Testament also contain teaching about money and prosperity. And while they are linked, money and prosperity are not the same thing. I'll come back to this point later. <clears throat> in the parable of the sower, the seed of the message is crowded out by the worries of this life the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things so that no fruit is produced. That's from Mark chapter 4, verse 19 in the New Living Translation. But other translations talk about the deceitfulness of riches or the seduction of wealth. We know all about the worries of life, especially during the COVID lockdowns and the economic circumstances in Zimbabwe. But what is meant by the deceitfulness of riches? Paul, writing to Timothy, said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. And he warns that in pursuing wealth, some have wandered away from the true faith, and as a result, have pierced themselves with many sorrows. Jesus said that it is impossible to serve both God and money, in Luke chapter 16 and verse 13. Our trust is to be in God alone, and in the completed work of Jesus at Calvary. The deceitfulness of wealth is the temptation to trust in the ability to buy a solution to our problems or our challenges. But Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 4 warns that wealth provides no security when we are facing wrath and judgment. Only the righteousness that comes from faith in Jesus rescues us from judgment. The deceitful nature of wealth is such that some are convinced that they are serving God when they're actually have become slaves to money. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 28 warns that he who leans on and trusts in and is confident in his riches will fall, but the righteous who trust in God's provision will flourish. In chapter 23 and verse 5, the writer warns that wealth is temporary. He says that it flies away on the wings of eagles. Circumstances can make wealth disappear. Inflation can destroy a lifetime of savings. A government decree can make an accumulated bank balance worthless. Many of us have lived through this once and we seem to be facing it again. Only God remains the same yesterday, today and forever. We must keep our trust focused on him and his provision and not on our own resources. God brought us through before 
and he'll bring us through again. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 that our lives are not measured by the abundance of our possessions. And at the conclusion of the parable of the rich farmer, he warns, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not to have a rich relationship with God. Just because something is dangerous doesn't mean we need to avoid it completely. It means we need to use it carefully and for its intended purpose. Knives are good and useful tools, especially when preparing and eating food, but they can be used to kill. Most things are not dangerous in themselves, but in the way that they are used. And the response to the dangers of wealth is not to be intentionally poor, but to use it according to the principles and teachings of Scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18, Moses exhorted the people of Israel to constantly remember that God is the source of their wealth and their provision. And he warned them and us in verse 17 to beware of thinking that wealth was a result of their own efforts and diligence. Earlier in the chapter, in verses 9 and 10, he says that where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking, when you have eaten your fill, that is the time to be careful. <clears throat> Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God. It is still a trap that is easy to fall into. In times of abundance and ease, we can quickly forget that God is our source. We are less likely to succumb to the temptations and the pitfalls of wealth if we remember and understand the purpose of blessing. The angel of the Lord told Abram, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. God's purposes remain the same. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians chapters 9 verses 8, 10 and 11, God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Wealth becomes a stumbling block when our focus becomes the accumulation of more. More money, more possessions, more comfort. Jesus said, how difficult it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 18 and verse 24. The purpose of biblical prosperity is so that we can be conduits of God's blessing and provision to others. When we properly use the abundance with which we are blessed, God gets the glory and the kingdom is further established. The antidote to the danger of abundance is generosity. Talon spoke about generosity last week, so I will not spend too much time on this, but I want to emphasize what generosity looks like. It is not an outward extravagant show of giving, although the gift itself may be extravagant. Generosity is using our resources to be a blessing to someone else. It always has a cost to self. It may be a once-off gift, or it may be a regular assistant to someone who needs help. It could be paying for the groceries of a stranger at the checkout when they're stranded, it could be helping someone with school fees when they're struggling to meet the commitment. Generosity begins with family. Paul says, those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the truth fate. Such people are worse than unbelievers in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. But generosity impacts fellow believers and those outside the faith. While some of our generosity is sacrificial, it is not meant to result in hardship. Paul gave extensive instruction to the Corinthians. He said, give in proportion to what you have, and whatever you have, you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly, and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. As the scriptures say, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 11 to 15. Be aware of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you hear of someone with a need, and you have a means to help, it may just be that God wants you to be the conduit of his blessing to that person in that situation. Be especially 
aware of needs and leadership. They're the most likely to neglect their own needs and taking care of others. A pillar of the Old Testament law was, do not neglect the Levites who labor among you. And writing to Timothy, Paul taught, elders who perform their duties especially well are to be considered worthy of double honor, that is financial support, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word of God. That's from the Amplified Version. John's third letter is a showcase for the purpose of prosperity. John writes to his friend and colleague and starts in verse 2 saying, I hope that all is well with you and that you are healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. That's the New Living Translation. In the Amplified Bible, it says, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as I know your soul prospers spiritually. There is so much in this short letter that it's a challenge to know where to start. In verses 5 and 6, John commends his friend Gaius for the way that he has used his financial and material resources to provide for the needs of traveling ministers, even though Gaius did not know them when they first arrived. John reports how his help had resulted in reports of his kindness and his generosity. Gaius loved the truth and it was made evident by his outward actions. He used his resources to advance the kingdom by providing for those who taught the gospel and brought truth to those who lacked it. In contrast, John mentions Diotrephes, who not only refused to help visiting teachers, but forbade others to help them and expelled people from fellowship for their hospitality. Biblical prosperity is meant for all believers, but it looks different for each believer. It is worth emphasizing again the dangers of focusing on wealth as a measure of prosperity. In his letter to Timothy, Paul tells him, people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. That's 1 Timothy 2 verse, sorry, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9. Wealth without physical health deprives us of the ability to work for the furtherance of the kingdom and prevents us enjoying life and comfort. I know wealthy people who would gladly exchange their riches for a healthy body. Wealth also cannot replace healthy relationships. I'm sure we all know families that have been torn apart by arguments over inheritances, possibly even our own family. I know a very wealthy man who's been divorced several times, and I've heard him express his envy of those with stable and loving marriages. I suspect that he would gladly sacrifice some, maybe even most of his finances for a healthy marriage and family life. The inward prosperity of our soul can influence the outward manifestation of prosperity. In Matthew, Jesus taught that while it is natural to be concerned about our daily needs for food, clothing and shelter, other things are more important. In Matthew chapter 6 verses 32 and 33, concluding the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these. But first and most importantly, seek, aim at and strive after his kingdom and his righteousness his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all of these things will be given to you also. We can trust God to provide our needs, but if our souls are not prospering in our relationship with God and our focus is on the wrong things, the dangers and the temptations of wealth can be multiplied. Great wealth and great power, both manifestations of outward prosperity, can do great damage to both the possessor and to others around them when they are not guided and directed by the grace of God. History is full of examples of the damage caused by the lust for wealth and power, caused by those who pursue them and those who possess them. One commentary I consulted during my preparation said, Note the reasons for which this soul prosperity may be regarded as the measure or standard for outward prosperity. Firstly, destitute of inward grace, it is neither for a man's own good nor for that of his fellow man that he should be possessed of outward wealth or power. And secondly, if a man's soul be right with God, the possession of these outward advantages is both safe for himself and profitable for others. Sometimes by God's grace and mercy, our prayers for financial resources are not answered the way that we wish. James addressed the issue in chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 of his letter when he said, 
Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. The presence or absence of wealth and power is not a measure of God's approval or disapproval. We serve him. He does not serve us. No one had greater approval from God than his son Jesus, and yet Jesus had no wealth and few possessions. The Gospels tell us that his ministry was funded and supported by others, and at the foot of the cross soldiers gambled for his clothing. The prophets and the Gospels tell us that for our sakes he became poor so that we might inherit the riches of eternity. While the Bible contains stories of men who loved and served God wholeheartedly while possessing great men, great wealth, sorry. Men such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, and David. It also has examples of men of great wealth and power who either well fell away from following God or denied his power. Men such as Solomon, Nebuchadnezzar, and Haman. Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame, is a list of many whom we regard as heroes of faith, including Abraham, Moses, Joseph, and others of wealth and power. But the chapter concludes with a list of people that many might consider failures. Others were tortured to death, refusing to accept release offered on the condition of denying their faith, so that they would be resurrected to a better life. And others experienced the trials of mocking and scourging amid torture, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. They were put to death with the sword. They went about wrapped in the skins of sheep and goats, utterly destitute, oppressed, cruelly treated, people of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains, and living in caves and holes in the ground. All of these, though they gained divine approval through their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised. Even today, Many believers, particularly in the 1040 window, face trials, torture, oppression, destitution, and sometimes execution rather than deny their faith. Men and women who chose to hold on to truth, even when it means giving up wealth and worldly influence. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13 to 16 talks about these people when it says, All these people died, still believing that God, what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. And that is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And that's the, the New Living Translation. To summarize as I conclude, biblical prosperity is not defined by financial wealth alone. It includes physical health, healthy relationships, and spiritual well-being established on the truth of the gospel. It is not measured by the quantity and value of our possessions. The purpose of prosperity is to enable us to be generous towards others as conduits of God's blessing. Our financial status is not evidence of God's approval or displeasure. His love and concern for us and for our well-being means that he will never place us in a situation where we will be tempted beyond our ability to endure, including the temptations that accompany financial abundance. Many people who are prosperous in the biblical sense will face difficulties and challenges because we live in a broken, fallen world, and in part to help us retain our hope and trust in God alone. In closing, I'd like to leave you with a few questions for personal contemplation and possibly for group, group discussion. Firstly, do I truly trust God to meet all of my needs as the scriptures teach? Secondly, am I using the resources that God has given me to be a channel of his blessing to others? And thirdly, does my generosity to others result in praise and honor to God? Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the abundance of your blessing towards us. Lord, help us in our abundance to be generous with others, to be channels of your blessing 
to others who are, who are in greater need than, than ourselves. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of your Spirit. Lord, give us wisdom and understanding as we handle the possessions and the, and the financial prosperity <clears throat> and the health and relationships that you have given to us. Help us to continue to walk steadfastly in your ways. Help us to keep our focus firmly fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a really great weekend. Thanks, Andre, for that very pertinent word and uh, lots of useful information and uh, understanding that's come with with the two sessions that we've had together. One was generosity that Talent shared with last week, and this one is biblical prosperity. And we felt it was important that we spend time on those because they're, they're, they're areas that can be quite easily confused in terms of God's word and and how he wants us to walk those, uh, walk those out in terms of what he says. Um, I just want to go over the myths that we'll be breaking this morning. The myths and the discussion points are going to be financial, financial wealth is proof of God's approval and financial lack is evidence of his disapproval. The second one is prosperity means I'm shielded from all difficulties and challenges in life. And the third one is prosperity means I will be financially wealthy. Okay, so you've got those three. We hope you can have a great uh, discussion this morning at home. And certainly for those after the service, we trust that you're going to spend time discussing those here in your groups. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was for those of you that are at home, please remember that the link for the Kids Church is still active. Uh, the One Life uh, link will be part of the service, and we encourage you with your kids still to to access that. That's going to continue, even though that we're going to be um, meeting at the, at the at the church on Sundays as well. Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to close in prayer this morning, and I trust that you guys will have a, a great Sunday. Um, and the rest of the day. Father God, we just thank you for your message this morning. Father God, we have so much to learn about generosity, so much to learn about prosperity. And Father, um, we just trust, Lord, that you would help us to have a fuller understanding of what biblical prosperity means, Father. We trust, Lord, that when we ask you and we speak to you about things related to prosperity, that it would be not with the wrong motives, Father, and that you would grow us, that you would mature us, so that as we grow and we are prospering, Father, that we would be asking with the right motives, Father. We pray, Lord, for a spiritual understanding, a deep revelation of what, a, what biblical prosperity means, Father, that it's not about money, Father, but that it's about servanthood, it's about service to you and about service to others, Father, and about extending your kingdom. So, Father, we lift the, the rest of the day up to you. We lift the discussion up to you. Uh, in your mighty name we pray. Amen.